their eyes, microphones, and can actually gesture. So they can let you know if they don't understand you. They can try to get your attention. And so the Simon Project was something that uh, Andrea found me and said, you know what? Design is going to be really important. And I really give her a lot of credit for uh, reaching out and saying, you know, I have a lot of experience. She had started at the MIT Media Lab, um, where she worked with uh, Cynthia Brazil on, and this is Kismet. So this was one of the very first social robots that was an experiment in seeing just what I described to you. How can people interact with a robot just by going up to them and talking to them? And after Kismet, uh, the team that Cynthia was leading and Andrea was on developed Leonardo. So this is Leonardo. Now, for Leonardo, they said, we're going to go big time. And they went to a Hollywood studio, Will Vinton Studios, and they started with Kismet, and they developed Leonardo. This robot has real yak hair. It has leather lips. It has eyelashes. Um, if you're at MIT and can go to the MIT Museum, you can actually see this robot. And it's quite amazing. The fingers are highly crafted, and they're very detailed. And um, what happened, though, when they were using this robot to study research subjects, children ran screaming from the room <laughs> because it just fell into what researchers call the uncanny valley. So the more a robot looks like a real creature, we start to like it and like it and like it. And it gets to a pinnacle when it's just creepy. And so that's what happened here. So some of our learnings from this project um, I know I can see now that you can't see this, but um, I'll just tell you what they are. So first of all, eyes are very important as um, a natural and intuitive mechanism for human-robot interaction. Um, Creature-like does offer better success than human-like because it sets expectations. It lets people know, you know what, this thing is not as smart as you are, and it's not like you, it's different. Um, Hyperrealism in features such as the fur and the eyelashes can make things become a little bit creepy. Um, so for us, what we wanted to do was a balance between machine aesthetics and human forms to help avoid what I just called the uncanny valley. Um, so then while Leo had over 30 degrees of freedom in the head and face, the ears were what mo mo were most often used as a mode of expression. And any of you who have pets, you might know. Um, I have a dog who I adore, and he, his ears will tell me everything. So um, we knew that that was something that was going to be important. And so a desirable feature set for the head was going to be a rotating and pivoting head, movable eyes, top and bottom eyelids. We were looking at a mouth, eyebrids, and an expressive ear feature. So um, we knew this particular robot is what we call non-ambulatory. It doesn't walk. Um, so we had to think also about how that was going to appear to people. So it often appears behind the table. Somebody comes in and they sit on the other side of the table. Um, we wanted uh, it to appear young to reinforce its role as a learner. This robot can see objects. You can give it instructions, and then it can learn. It can learn colors. It can parse out a sentence and hear the word green and attach that to the color of the object you're showing it. Um, and we wanted it to look friendly and inquisitive. This was a, my starting point. So um, we work with a really brilliant team of robot builders in uh, the Bay Area called Mecha Robotics, M-E-K-A. And um, they were building the body. And so I knew that uh, this was what I was going to be starting with. And everything else was really a blank slate, which was very exciting and also very daunting. But as a designer, the first thing I wanted to do was establish a vocabulary. So for you and your projects, getting started, it's very helpful to look and look at existing designs out there. You're never really reinventing the wheel, even with aesthetics. So. Um, what I did was, and I call it a little bit like being an optometrist. So I sat with Andrea, who has years and years of experience in robot design. And I said, do you think it should be more like this or more like this? Or more like this or more like this? And we kind of narrowed it down. So, And I made some categories and started making a, a language around it. Um, so I have the femme fatale category. 
We have the toy bot category. There's a whole soft skin category, um, a beefcake category, of course. Um, there's a whole series of subculture of people who are doing human clone robots, which you may see in the news. Um, this one that I call Spaceman Appliance. And we eventually settled on the friendly doll category. And then we started doing our research and showing images to um, various people related to the lab and friends and also children as well as adults. So we define this friendly doll aesthetic as um, something that has a figure-like impression, non-threatening forms, um, affordances that subjects, suggest multiple fun functions. So it should do many things. It should look like it does many things. Um, and we didn't want it to look like it had muscles. We wanted to really balance this idea of a human and a machine. So some of the references, and I really love collecting images, and sometimes what I'll do is I'll collect these images and I'll actually pin them up on a wall, and I'll keep them there while I draw. And this is something that I also really recommend. This is a partner robot from Sony that does play musical instruments, and there was something about this. So um, then this is a, a concept project from a Drexel University student. Um, it's called Frobo. This you may recognize. Anybody know this robot's name? Marvin! <laughs> um, Marvin was an inspiration for us as well. It seemed to embody these characteristics of being kind of maybe a toddler proportions, um, looking like a machine, but also being kind of human. Um, this is Mega Man. Um, then, of course, I'll look at things that aren't robots. Money. Uh, this is Toonami Tom, who I think doesn't exist anymore, but used to be on the Cartoon Network. And I'll just plaster my wall with these, and I'll copy these, and I'll draw them myself, and I'll try to get, understand, and then have a lot of conversations with my team. Like, what is it about this robot that we like? What do we not like? And then that's where we put together characteristics. So the characteristics that we discovered from looking at these images and showing the images to people and having conversations were that the top of the head would have some covering of some sort, that it was less threatening if the robot seemed like it had a hat or hair of some sort, and maybe something ambiguous that could be hair or a helmet. Um, the ears were going to be abstracted to seem as large as possible because we knew they were important. So maybe they would look like antennae. Um, the eyes would be distinctive as they are very much the focal point. People will look in this robot's eyes. Um, mouth and eyebrows were going to be used, although you'll see that they dropped out at some point. And the proportions were going to be childlike for the head and the body ratio. I also love to look at a lot of references. So these are some of the books that um, I started collecting. Of course, you'll want to read about robots. So um, this is a book that's called Flesh and Machine by Rodney Brooks at MIT Media Lab. Um, Robo Sapiens is a collection of robots. There have been many uh, more books in the years since this project. Uh, I also looked at books about animation. Um, and cartooning the head and figure because I knew that people who do cartoons are really, really sensitive to proportion and to the ways that the shapes of the face communicate emotion, which is what this is all about. And then I started looking at any reference. So, and I'll also um, recommend that you do this. Carry a sketchbook with you and anything you see. And there would be moments that I would see things that would start to inspire because I had this set of rules in my head now. For example, the hair helmet thing. Like, how are we going to do this hair helmet thing? And at one point I was in a, um, a toy store and I saw this and I thought, that's kind of good. That's kind of hair helmet. And I went to my friend's house and I visited her daughter and I said, that's kind of hair helmet. I like it. Um, and of course, you know, thinking about What's going to happen to this face when it needs to so show facial expressions? And there is a lot of information online on what the exaggeration of uh, different emotions are. And then we started looking at different head shapes and also the eye size. I think this is a little blown out, but we did a lot of studies of the relationship between the size of the eyes to the whole size of the head, as well as the placement of the eyes. And then um, I was really thrilled about this ear thing, getting to create ears that are not ears, that are part of a helmet, that are antennae. So I did a lot of sketches around what the ears might be and taking a look at different ear shapes. 
And so I can show you some initial explorations. Um, these were some of the first things that I was thinking. Now, of course, our robot didn't have legs, but it helped me to start to draw the whole creature and, and think about what it might look like. And I was kind of thinking this little sort of bear, dog, cat creature. Um, you know, something a little like this. You can see it's very inspired by Marvin and Toonami and Mega, uh, Mega Man and some of the other robots we're looking at. Um, so these are very become very inspirational at the early stages of the project. And then what I do is I bring it into Illustrator and I try to superimpose it. So that diagram that you saw earlier that I called my blank slate, um, I started taking the drawings and seeing what would it look like on that body. And so these are some initial explorations. Some initial 3D sketch. So at some point I like to sketch in 3D. I use Rhino as my main tool. And then um, when it came to making it real, that's when the team really came together. So the core team was myself, um, Andrea, who's Dr. Tomaz, and Jonathan Holmes, who was um, an engineer at the Georgia Tech Research Institute. And we will have a lot of meetings once a week, and we'll share what we were looking at. So um, the eyeball mechanism was something very important for me to design around. And actually, this became the core element that everything was going to be structured around, because the shape of the eyeballs were dependent as of the camera. And so we got the smallest cameras that we could, and then went from there, built everything from there. So knowing that, knowing that I had a set eye to head ratio and a set head to body ratio to give us the aesthetics that we wanted, I used that as the core. And then we did lots and lots of iterations. These are some iterations around what the neck might be like. Um, and some iterations around how the ears might connect. And then this is a, one when we were getting to a point where we were able to look at the head that we designed on the robot. And so this is a 3D rendering. And at this point, then, we started doing some 3D animations so that I could show it to the extended team. Because in addition to our core team, there's also a team of PhD students who were really starting to program these behaviors. So they'll actually take my renderings and put them into Maya and start to program what these things are going to look like. And then we can kind of go back and forth and say, you know, if the ears were a little smaller, we'd be able to do this. And then, of course, we do a lot of scale models. So um, these were printed on a dimension printer at Georgia Tech. And these also really help us get a real sense of what the form is going to be like and how it's going to look. We found a ping pong ball, and then we scaled our scaled models around this uh, ping pong ball. And then um, originally the plan for the head was to have functioning eyelids as well as a mouth. And again, all of the robots that were in research up to this time had slots in their shells where the eyebrows and the lips could move. And we really felt like this was something that would be very obvious. So what we did is we came up with a way to have magnets behind the shell so that the motor would move the magnets and move the eyebrows and move the lips. Um, at some point, we the budget called for taking out those motors. So you'll see the final robot doesn't actually have the eyebrows. Um, but in the process of doing this, um, we did a lot of studies. So this is a study that I did with actually printing out um, a paper image of our design and then doing a rubber lips with magnets again. So um, my advice as a designer is make up whatever tools you need to in order to get a sense. It's very important to get a sense of things ahead of time. So here I had, um, there's actually a piece of plexiglass that's over this. And then I have my magnets, and I can move them so I can get the different expressions of the mouth. Um, we were looking at doing body shells as well. So these were some early 3D renderings. Um, the body shells are still in progress, so the robot you'll see doesn't have these shells. Um, but since the robot didn't have legs, 
I was trying to create some forms that might look like it was kneeling or sitting in some way. Um, but now the moment of truth. Let me show you a little bit of what it was like when it came to life. So the, um, the final shells were actually 3D printed as well. Um, we send them out to a very high-end facility that gives us a very high-resolution shell. So these are the shells of the robot head. And then we have them professionally painted. Um, you can see inside. So these were the slots that I was talking about for the magnets that would control the eyebrows. And then at one point, I had asked Jonathan, our engineer, can we put LEDs in the ears? And he said, yeah, I guess so. And I said, I'm not really sure why, but another dimension of expression might be really great. And I'll show you later, it turned out to be something really great. And then the, head, the neck mechanism was extremely complex. This is some of Jonathan's experiments here. This, um, I think, is really interesting just to see a little bit of the head construction. And um, then, uh, are you ready? This is my favorite picture of Simon ever. So this is what the robot looks like today. The body shells are still something that we're exploring because what we had we found restricted the motion. Um, but this is an image that appeared on the New York Times this past January, um, and he was posed. Uh, so here's another picture. This is a picture of Simon actually looking at an object. Um, one thing that's very, very special about Simon is his gaze. You really get a sense that this is a, an entity looking at something and gazing at something. So the way it works is when you hand him, he's got pads in his hands. When you hand him an object, he'll grasp it and he'll hold it up to his eyes. And then he's trying to look for the color. In the video I'm going to show you, what he's doing is he's sorting objects. So you have a set sentence structure you say to him. You say, Simon, where does this go? And Simon will say, it goes in the yellow bin. If it's never seen yellow before, it'll give you this gesture and say, I don't know. And then you say it goes in the yellow bin. And then Simon has learned yellow because it knows that sentence structure and it knows to pull out the word yellow. So these are some of Simon's different expressions. Coy, shy, happy. <laughs> you can kind of guess. Um, and Simon's in an ongoing project right now at Georgia Tech. So this is just one example of um, a researcher. So I'm going to show you a video from, this is from the Computer Human Interaction Conference in 2011, and you can see Simon in action. The audio is a little loud because we were at a conference, um, but somebody has a headset so that even though he has microphones at the conference, it was better to have the headset. You say, Simon, take this. Simon says, sure. And he does this thing where he holds it up to his eyes. And then you see his ears actually turn the color. And that was, for me, the most um, remarkable moment because I felt like, my gosh, Simon knows what I'm trying to do. Simon knows what I'm thinking. Um, and you say, where does it go? And Simon says it goes in the red bin. And he actually will put it in that bin. It can see the bins, and it can see where it goes. And you say, Simon takes this. So Simon says, sure, and holds out a hand and grasps it in his hand. And then he'll hold it up again to his eyes. The ears turn green. It's seen it. But now he's going to say, not sure. And he does this little gesture that, that there it's a little subtle. Later on in the video, it's a little more pronounced. But you say, put it in the green bin. And Simon will say, OK. I'm going to speed it up a little bit. So we reset it. And now, again, you say, Simon, where does this go? The ears turn green, but he says, I don't know. It goes in the green bin. And then I'll put it in the green bin, and I'll register the word green. So here's a little bit of what people said. 
Um, people said, it's cool, it's pretty lifelike. I was amazed by it. Um, regarding the robot's gaze, I was surprised at first, but it made the interaction easier because I knew that he knew some of what I was saying. Um, one person said, what was amazing was that his movements felt like there was something in there learning, and it wasn't just all motors, metal, and plastic. Um, and Simon's been getting a lot of great press. Uh, this was on the cover of Technology Review. This was a piece in the New York Times from a year ago. Um, so if you look online, you can learn a lot about this robot. Um, I wrote a piece for the Sunday Review about product design and aesthetics. And um, I had to show it to Simon, of course. And um, uh, lately, Simon's been involved in some more sophisticated generation of believable motion, as well as recognizing other people's um, activities. So they're working very hard on having Simon get your attention. And we also have a new robot that's called Simon's Cousin. So Simon's cousin, we wanted to be like Simon, but not exactly like Simon. So I designed ear pods of a slightly different shape, but clearly from the same family. Um, and this is the face of Simon, Simon's cousin. I was very concerned that the mouth had dropped out, so I had us add these speaker grills in the mouth to give you impression that there is a mouth, but we, the researchers were very concerned about not detracting from the other expressions, because they found that between the ears and the eyes, they really didn't need the eyebrows and the mouth. And this robot is very, very challenging, because it's actually on a cart, and it floats like a torso. So this, as a designer, was something that, like, I said, no, that's a crazy thing. So I've been working really hard. I've been flying down to Georgia and working on some ways that we can have um, accordion uh, mechanisms that are just shells that cover this part that moves up and down. Because this is a robot that's able to go down on the ground and pick things up. It's also able to be up. Um, and for my last minute, what I want to do is I want to show you the video from the piece I did in the New York Times, which really shows why, as a product designer, I'm so excited about this and how I see robots going beyond research labs and into our everyday lives. So here's the video. I'm Carla, and this is a day in the near future. Another Monday morning, my lamp has just gone from dim to bright. I try to turn over, but it rotates to follow me. I stumble into the bathroom. I brush one side for a while. The toothbrush vibrates, so I know it's time to switch to the other side. Now I'm really awake. The bathroom mirror says, nice job on your weight, but your heart rate is a little higher than yesterday. As I head to work, my bike confirms my appointment. On our way to Ted's office? Yes. When it's time to turn, my handlebar vibrates and my jacket lights up to signal a left turn. At the meeting, I draw some sketches with my memory pen. When we're done, it emails my notes to my colleagues. Back at home, the door recognizes me. The lights turn on, the stereo starts playing, and my 3D printer whistles to let me know the dog toy I downloaded earlier for Roo is ready. Now it's time for dinner. My countertop sous chef checks my favorite recipes and wirelessly queries the fridge. We have ingredients to make roasted salmon or pumpkin risotto. Let's do the salmon, I say. After dinner, my partner Mike and I bring our dishes to the sink. I say, OK, start cleaning and the faucet squirts soap and water at the dishes while we head off to relax with our favorite movie, Back to the Future. So that's all for today, but thank you so much. Feel free to look me up and email me. Um,